I want to welcome you to this presentation I'm putting together for you today uh, entitled, Are Current Training Models Failing Officers and Communities Alike? I've done a lot of research over the past couple of years and I'm going to present to you now the results of that research. I'm Don McCurry, I'm President of Premier Police Training and I'm really glad you're here with me and I'm going to take you on a journey now so stick with me as I present the answers to the question are current training models failing officers and communities alike? Hey, we've got a problem here. What did you do? Nothing. I stirred the tanks. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Question one for you. Do you believe there are significant problems with law enforcement training in the United States? Yes or no? So what do you think? From your opinion, what's the answer? I'm going to share with you now my answer to the question, and it's an absolute yes. There are significant problems with law enforcement training in this country. So chapter one, procedural justice. Now, if you haven't heard of this term before, stay tuned because you're going to. It's, it's growing uh, in use and popularity. And we're going to explore this whole idea of procedural justice. From Science Daily, quote, in particular, studies show that people react to whether or not they believe the procedures used by the police are just. Now, this is an idea referred to as procedural justice. Well, let's move to fire science. They had an article, Building Trust in Law Enforcement Through Service. It, law enforcement, must address the key issues of today like crisis intervention, procedural justice. Okay, well, there it is again. And in fire science, they identified procedural justice as one of the key issues of today facing law enforcement. We now move to the United States Department of Justice. Community-oriented policing services are friends at the cops office. Procedural justice focuses on the way police and other legal authorities interact with the public and how the characteristics of those interactions shape the public's views of the police. Interesting. Many people can still come away with a favorable opinion of police, even if the contact wasn't in their favor. Uh, there's a caveat to this though. As long as they were treated fairly and their rights weren't violated. That's procedural justice. Chapter two, two roadblocks to developing effective training models. First one we're gonna look at is this thing uh, that I've entitled a lack of training priorities. Okay, a lack of training priorities. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, now we move to question two for you. What is the most common reasons agencies say they can't provide training? Is it time, money, we're understaffed, or is it D, none of the above? So what do you think it is? And it's not just can't provide training, but quite frankly, from my experience, it's, well, we won't provide training because of this most common reason. Well, which one? Go ahead and choose. And then from my perspective, as I have made my travels across the nation, putting on training, we're going to explore this first roadblock. We don't have the money. I'm going to take you to one year, 2018. And we're going to look at the payouts to settle police misconduct. And I'm only going to take you to four cities. We're going to start with New York. In 2018, the city of New York paid out more than $50 million to settle cases of police misconduct. Now, continuing west, let's go to Chicago. More than $100 million. And even farther west, let's go to Los Angeles. In 2018, Los Angeles paid out more than $200 million to settle cases of police misconduct. Now, with the recent 
uh, George Floyd incident that just happened in Minneapolis. I'm just going to take you back to 2018 in Minneapolis to one case, the Ruzik settlement. $20 million for one settled case. Uh, and that was a use of force situation. Folks, that's $370 million. And if you want to take out those four cities in 2018 at a rate of pay, here it is. $42,000 per hour. More importantly, I think, than the money is, you know what, there are a lot of lost careers in those incidents. And I can tell you, there was a lot of community trust broken. So, from my experience, what is the top reason agencies don't, can't, won't provide training? Well, Don, we don't have the money for training. Eh, I'll tell you what, I got to throw a flag on that one. All right, I, I got to. There's no, no doubt about it. Because, see, money, ladies and gentlemen, is changing hands. In fact, a lot of money is changing hands because of police misconduct, particularly Fourth Amendment violations, search and seizure, use of force. But the problem is, with all this money changing hands, it's just not for training. Now let's move to the second category of lack of training priority. And this is the selection of training topics. And I'm going to spend a lot more time on this one than on priorities. So let's really explore this idea of, of selection of training topics being a roadblock to developing proper law enforcement training models. The following list that you're going to see is based on an analysis of over 20,000 news stories in 2017. And it was conducted by retired Lieutenant Raymond Foster with the Los Angeles Police Department. He, he identified the top 10 issues that were listed out of these 20,000 news stories in 2017 that were raised continuously. Now, why did he do it? Because he wanted to create conversations among law enforcement officials about these issues. So now you're wondering, okay, wow, 20,000 news stories. Uh, that's quite a, 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 an amount of time in that analysis. So what are those top 10 issues? Well, here they are. Officer-involved shootings, body-worn cameras, opioids, active shooters and mass casualty shootings, legalized marijuana, vehicle pursuits, immigration, DNA evidence, intelligence-led policing, and human trafficking. Let's go to a different source, Police One. And in an article, uh, they entitled Five of the Biggest Issues Facing Law Enforcement in 2019, they listed active shooter, police transparency, officer recruitment, immigration and sanctuary laws, and police use of force and de-escalation policies. Well, let's go to agencies. What do they identify as the main issues when they're surveyed? Well, here they are. Weapons qualification, domestic violence, community-oriented policing, radar LIDAR operator, firearms, defensive tactics, mental health, persons in crisis, leadership, ethics, active killer, and de-escalation. Folks, I think we have missed the mark. Now let's move to chapter three, the big three. And I'm going to come back to that missing the mark comment that I just made. So let's move to chapter three. I want you to think about it right now. I want you to identify what you think the top three mistakes are that are committed by officers across the country that result in the majority of lawsuits and settlements against officers and agencies. And these top three mistakes, they also result not just in the majority of lawsuits, but in the majority of lost careers and community distrust. The big three mistakes, the top three mistakes, resulting in the top three consequences to our profession. So what do you think those are? In fact, write them down if you want, okay? You see, if we can predict the causes of those three common mistakes, 
we can develop specific strategies to prevent them. So if we can predict them, we can prevent them. And by the way, if you weren't familiar with this model, it's used extensively by risk management. Now, do you think we could maybe learn a lesson from risk management? I'm going to introduce you to Gordon Graham, president of Lexapol. Very unique human being. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to co-present in training in San Diego last October with Mr. Graham. And his famous ma mantra is, predictable is preventable. Uh, one thing I'll tell you about Mr. Graham and myself, uh, we don't look anything alike but we share the same brain. When it comes to these things that, we're gonna, that I'm talking about and that uh, he and I visited about, we share the same brain. Um, it, and so I want you to think about this saying of his, predictable is preventable, because I'm gonna be coming back to this and interweaving it through the rest of this presentation. It's that important, okay? That's why it's that important. Predictable is preventable. So we're back to this now. You've had a little bit of time to think about it. Did you identify what you think the top three mistakes are committed by officers that result in the majority of lawsuits and settlements against officers and agencies, also resulting in lost careers and lots and lots of community distrust? Well, what do you think? Well, here we go. From my research, here are the top three reasons officers and agencies get sued. And I'm going to start with number three. Now compare it to your list. Unreasonable force. Now I'm going to quiz you. There's two categories that fall in underneath unreasonable force. And I'm going to see if you are aware of this. There is the unreasonable use or application of force, which we saw in the, in the George Floyd case in Minneapolis recently. But did you know that you can also be sued with a, uh, under the Fourth Amendment violation or with a Fourth Amendment violation uh, for unreasonable display of force? It's not just use or application. You can be sued for unreasonable display of force as well. That's from Baird v. Uh, Renbarge of 2009 and other cases. So that's number three, unreasonable force. Well, what did you think number two was? We'll see how, see how close you are. The number two reason is unlawful arrest. Now there's another term for that, it's called false imprisonment. Closely related to unlawful arrest and false imprisonment is our number one reason. Officers and agencies get sued and officers will lose their jobs and the fomenting of community distrust. Here it is, unlawful stops and detentions the big three. That's what I want to refer to now as uh, throughout the west, uh, rest of this presentation is the big three. Now I want you to look at these three lists again. Almost 30 issues that were identified recently from three different sources. Look at that. Those top three mistakes that I identified in the previous slide are they contained somewhere in these lists? Where do you see them? If they are indeed identified as the top issues from my research, shouldn't those have been then, that, that fact been reflected in the issues facing law enforcement that they're trying to take care of through training? Hmm. Told you, my research showed clearly that we're missing the mark. And folks, people are being hurt and people are dying. Now these topics are all important, but they aren't geared to preventing the big three. Yeah, we've missed the mark. Chapter four, officer authority. We're going to go back to the COPS office, U.S. Department of Justice, and we're going to look at procedural justice again, advancing police legitimacy. You think that's happening right now in the country? What do you think? 
See, that's because procedural justice is a general term referring to the way, the way in which police officers exercise their authority. And I want you to write those three words down, exercise their authority, because we're going to come back to that. Exercise their authority. Its importance develops out of the many studies suggesting that people react to legal authority primarily by judging how fairly officers exercise their authority. In fact, that statement is so important, I'm going to emphasize it. I'm going to give you three questions coming up. And I want you to know that the answers to each of the three questions are in direct opposition to the tenets and ideals of procedural justice, which focuses on the way officers exercise their authority. All right, here we go. Don, roll it out for us, man. What's question number one? Well, what's really causing law enforcement to be sued? And I'm not talking about the proximate causes. I want you to identify what you think the real cause is. See, that's what happens when you dig deep and, and you go to the real cause. Well, what do you think the answer is? Well, here it is. It's officers who don't know their lawful authority during police citizen contacts. And that's primarily due to misguided, inadequate, or non-existent training. Okay, well, what's question two? All right, Don, what's really causing officers to get fired and lose their careers? Same answer. It's officers who don't know their lawful authority during police citizen contacts, primarily due to misguided, inadequate, or non-existent training. Okay, Don, give us question number three now. All right, here it is. What's really causing erosion of community trust? Mm-hmm. Yep. Officers who don't know their lawful authority during police citizen contacts. And that's primarily due to misguided, inadequate, or non-existent training. Now, am I starting to sound like a broken record? Yeah, because it represents what's happening out there to this profession of ours, or the law enforcement training, right? Houston. We have a problem. I want you to think about these three things that are going to come up on the screen now. Almost every negative news story about law enforcement, almost every one of them, and almost every negative report about law enforcement, almost every one of them, and almost every negative YouTube video about law enforcement, almost every one of them, are going to fall into one of three categories. Now, you want to take a guess at what those three things are. Well, here they are. The big three. Unlawful stops, unlawful arrests, and unreasonable force. And I want you to know that in those three categories, ladies and gentlemen, it's often the officer who escalates the police citizen contact, not the citizen. We're escalating. We are the escalators in the majority of these categories when it happens. Now, across the country, it's officer-induced escalation that is most harmful to the image of our profession. Officer-induced escalation. And unfortunately, many of the officers who find themselves at the wrong end of a lawsuit find out the hard way that even though maybe they thought they knew their lawful authority, they really didn't. Well, here we go. We got a problem, Don. Yeah, Don just showed we have a problem. And, well, to fix it, you have to realize there's a problem to begin with. And if you do even realize there's a problem, because I can show you article after article that says, well, there's nothing to fix, really. So in order to fix a problem, you have to realize there is a problem. Chapter 5, De-Escalation Training to the Rescue. De-Escalation Training, uh, by its common definition that you're going to find out there, teaches officers to slow down, create space, and use communication techniques to defuse potentially dangerous situations. 
It gives officers strategies to more calmly deal with people who are experiencing mental and emotional crises. And I agree with this. And by the way, uh, I'll make it official for the record, I'm not anti-de-escalation training at all. But I'm going to make some points about it coming up. And um, again, we have missed the mark. So if we put all our eggs in the de-escalation basket, I want to take you to the deafening demand for de-escalation training a systematic review and call for evidence in police use of force reform. Quote, with the possible exception of implicit bias training, now, these next three words, think of the exclusivity that's, in, that's included here. No other training is more often demanded by policymakers, politicians, police executives, academics, civil rights activists, and citizens, then what? De-escalation training for police. So let's take away, uh, between the two major yellow uh, words there, let's take the middle part out, and what does it say? No other training is more often demanded than de-escalation training. Hmm. De-escalation training also received hefty endorsement from the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, 2015, when it, de-escalation training, was identified as what? The only action item related specifically to police use of force. That's it, boys. Let's, no need to meet again. We've identified it as the only action item related specifically to police use of force. Hmm. That's sort of like a one-piece puzzle, isn't it? Question for you to just to chew on. What exactly are we trying to fix with de-escalation training? Was it ever intended to be used as a one-size-fits-all remedy for the ills of law enforcement? fact. De-escalation training is not effective when it's the officer who escalates the contact. And de-escalation training will not and cannot help an officer who doesn't know or is unsure of their lawful authority through every step of a police citizen contact. Now, I'm going to show you some videos. While viewing the following videos, I want you to consider these questions, okay? I, th I think they're important for uh, evaluative purposes. Number one, when you watch each video, can you identify the moment the officer demonstrated he didn't know his lawful authority? And then watch what happens, because can you identify then who was responsible for escalating the contact? Number three, can you see through this exercise, the clear relationship between officers who don't know their authority and the subsequent unlawful stop, unlawful arrest, and unreasonable display of or application of force. And number four, would de-escalation training have prevented any of these incidents? Let's watch. The passenger is Johnny Wheatcroft. He's in the front with another man. In the back seat, you can see his 11-year-old son, his 6-year-old, and their mother. Hey, when you turn in here, man, just make sure you throw your turn signal on for us. Yeah, that's all. Nobody has their ID on them? No. Anything with your name on it? Yeah, just grab it out real quick. Nothing in the car. There shouldn't be, right, anybody? Nothing. It's July 27, 2017, and these officers are part of a special unit assigned to high crime areas. This is a reverse angle from the other officer's body camera. You're looking at Officer Matthew Schneider. You can just step out and hang out right there. Remember that name, because things with Schneider are about to escalate quickly. Not, well, just hang on a minute, okay? Yeah, just hang on. 
Don't reach. Don't reach in your bag, man. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. You said you don't have no ID. I don't want no, you no, reaching in there. What's your name? Uh, why are you? Why am I even at the end? Well, you don't have ID, and then we made, a, we made it. Yeah, if you're a passenger in a vehicle, yeah. you need to have your ID. Why is that? I, don't have, I have an ID. I don't have to give it to you. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. Okay, well, I could take you down to the station and fingerprint you. Because we made a traffic stop on the vehicle, brother. That's I it. Didn't. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not doing nothing. Yeah. I just, you know, I'm just here trying to help Listen, you. We could do this one of two okay, ways. Okay, relax for a minute, please. I'm no, gonna, I'm going to relax. Listen. Listen to me. We're going to... Don't... Okay, I don't want you stuffing anything down in between oh, no, no, the seat no, 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 like no, no, you're doing. No, no. Relax. Okay, Keep your foot in there. Okay, stop, please. I do anything wrong. Right? Here's the deal. You tense up, okay, I'm going to... Okay, listen, okay. listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Relax your arm, okay? okay don't do start... Wrong? Listen. Do do A couple of things. One, okay, you don't have no ID on you, okay? I'm trying to do this as easy as we can. You already done yeah, stuff something down in no, your yeah. backpack and you stuff something down in the seat. Backpack, I promise you. Okay? I Are you gonna I fight didn't. or not? No, I'm not. Okay. I promise you I didn't step We're gonna do this. Okay. And well, I, I just watched you. No, you didn't, sir. You Let's pause for a quick second. Notice here, the officer has been grabbing Weecroft's arm for the past 34 seconds. That's kept the seatbelt from sliding off. And that's going to be important. Okay. Oh, oh, Listen. Oh, Oh, He's gonna fight, dude. I'm not, bro. Oh, I'm not okay. fighting. Relax. Okay, I'm not. Don't pull away. Hey, get your I'm not, taser bro. out. I'm not, bro. I'm not. You are. I'm not. I promise you that. You got a taser on you right now. He's not. He's not. I'm not doing nothing, man. I'm not doing nothing, bro. I'll tell you right now. You're gonna continue. Ow, oh, man. What the f is wrong with you? Relax. I am, dude. Ow, stop. I'm not gonna fight. Ow. Stop. Okay, let's move on now to the next video. Notice you're just sitting on the patio out there. What's that? I couldn't help but notice you're sitting on the patio behind this building. Yeah. Yeah, I just, and there's the signs for no trespassing, private property, here. that kind of thing. Yeah, I wasn't sure what you were doing, if you lived here or you worked here. Yeah, it looks like you're working, doing I something, picking stuff up. Okay, gotcha. What's the actual address then? Okay, what unit are you in? I don't think I have to actually tell you that. Well, I'm just checking to make sure that you have a right to be here, that's well, all. I just told you I lived here. Okay. I told you that I'm working as well. Okay. So should that be enough for you? Well, I, I gotta verify it, just so I know that, that you do in fact live here. What do you, what do you need for me? If you have an ID with your address on it, that'd be great. Well, we've had some stuff going on in this area. Yeah, I'm just I doing know. my job, just making sure you belong here. And if you do, then great, and I'll be on my way. Okay. Is they, do you have anything with your address on it? No, look, man. Here, uh, follow, why, don't you, why don't you follow just me, relax. and I'll just fucking leave the building, dude. Hey, just chill out, man. Dude, this is ridiculous. I'm just asking you if you have something with your address on it, oh, then that, that would help me. No, I don't. How am I okay. supposed to have something... With my address well, on Well, a lot of people have a they driver's just license. Their, they just carry something with their address on it? Yeah, an ID. It's ridiculous, bro. Yeah. So, Mr. Atkinson, can I get your date of birth, please? Why? I just need to verify who you are. That you belong here, that you have a right to be here, okay? Are you kidding me, man? Can you have a seat, please? No, no. Mr. Atkinson? No. No, I'm not. I'm not. 290 Cook 12. Can you please have a seat? No. Put that down. Stop.
Mr. Atkinson, right now you're obstructing a police officer, which is a jailable offense. I'm asking you one more time to sit down. I'm not doing anything wrong, and you're not going to arrest me. You're not going to do anything. Because I live here, and I didn't do anything wrong. Last chance, sir. For what? Have a seat. For what? For what? Sit you're down. Arrest the right now I'm detaining you someone? and investigating gonna, you for a trespass. Arrest, you're going to... I fucking live here, dumbass! Sit down. Sit down. No. That's what you are. You're a Have a seat, please. You're gonna tase me outside of my residence? I hope that Drop that. On. Put that down. I hope the on, sir. Put that I down. Really do. No, I'm working. You need I to listen to what I'm telling you to do right address. now. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything. Two ninety. We're on the east wrong. side of twenty three thirty three Folsom. Subjects failing you. to comply. Not sitting property, down. And, and he has. I'm Some safe. kind of a blunt object in the sand. Yeah. I'm just going to follow until my... Okay, we're going to continue now to the next video. Were you able to identify where the officer was wrong, didn't know his authority, and escalate it? And I'm going to tell you what, for those of you who have seen this video, it's not very long after this point in the video, the contact, that this young man now has an officer pointing his gun at him threatening to shoot him. A man with Down syndrome was hit, pepper sprayed, and arrested by a San Diego County Sheriff's deputy. Now the case is headed to trial. Only Team 10 obtained new video where the county admits the deputy had no reason to stop Antonio Martinez or use force. This was a case of a totally innocent, vulnerable child, essentially. Antonio Martinez is 22, but he functions and understands at a seven-year-old's level. Martinez has Down syndrome. He hugs his dad, kisses his dad a lot. He helps in the bakery. He was walking to his family's bakery in Vista in December of 2012 when he was stopped by a San Diego County Sheriff's deputy. A person with Down syndrome was assaulted taken away, held against their will. The arrest report shows Deputy Jeffrey Guy had responded to a possible domestic violence call on Postal Way. It turned out to be nothing. He was in a parking lot when he saw Martinez walking in a black hooded sweatshirt down the street. According to the report, when Martinez saw his car, he quickly pulled his hood up. Guy told him to stop. He didn't. He sprayed Martinez in the face with pepper spray and used his baton to hit him in the arms and leg. He put him in handcuffs and in the back of his car. They did not have a reasonable suspicion to use force on Tony Martinez that evening. Jude Basile represents the family. He questioned Officer Guy and Captain Joe Roddy under oath in a deposition. What did he do wrong? He did not have reasonable suspicion to stop and use force on him. Basile said that's a clear violation of the law. Unless they can say that this person is connected to a crime, they have to let them go. And they didn't do that. After Martinez was arrested and placed in the car, Deputy Guy said he was advised Martinez had Down syndrome. You got to see that takedown by the officer, that sweep, three different times. Now, you don't know the story behind this if you don't know the story. But not only was the stop illegal, so was the frisk. And just explain for me, what exactly was that individual, that's that so-called suspect, doing? Uh, he wasn't actively resisting. He wasn't posing an immediate threat to the officer or anyone else. So explain to me how come he ended up with a broken neck at the hands of that officer. Hello, license registration? Uh, what are you pulling me over for? I'll be glad to tell you as soon as you give me your information. Well, um, 
I'll give you my information once you can art articulate what crime I've committed. Okay. License registration. What crime have I committed? Okay. Step out of the vehicle. What crime have I committed? Step out of the vehicle. This is being recorded. I, I saw you, Kramer. Step out of the vehicle. <laughs> Step out of the vehicle. You're under arrest for disorderly conduct. Step out. That's not a charge for... Well, that didn't take long, did it? What I'm going to do then is I want you to consider all five of those videos. What did they have in common? All of them. Yes, officers who didn't know their authority, but what did they really all have in common? We'll go to this one. There's an individual First Amendment auditor taking pictures from a sidewalk. Well, police show up. Next thing you know, city's paying this guy $41,000. Why? Why did this police citizen contact go wrong, and who was responsible for escalating the contact? Now, I want you to read this paragraph. A California man who was a passenger in a vehicle said he was unlawfully arrested after refusing to identify himself or answer officers' questions during a traffic stop, and he gets a $60,000 check thanks to the city of Bakersfield police officers. Now, read this. Are you at a position with your training and knowledge in law enforcement and the Fourth Amendment, just by reading this paragraph, can you identify how and why the officers were wrong? And do you see how they escalated? Why? Why did these police citizen contacts go wrong and who was responsible for escalating them? And ladies and gentlemen, there's an even larger question. How would de-escalation training have prevented any of these officers from escalating their contacts? Remember, predictable is preventable. Were all of these incidents predictable? And if so, were they all preventable? Gordon Graham says they are. Risk management says they are, and you bet I do too. Go back to the U.S. Department of Justice, our friends at the COPS office. Procedural justice, advancing police legitimacy. Many studies suggest that people react to legal authority primarily by judging how fairly officers exercise their authority. And remember, last time I showed this to you, I emphasized that part, and I'm doing it again. So, how did these previous incidents that I just showed you shape the public's view of police? Do you believe that citizens saw procedural justice in any of those uh, incidents? Chapter 6, Enter Non-Escalation Training. Remember these three lists? Here they are again, almost 30 issues. What's missing? Non-escalation training. Well, what's that? Okay, fair question. The objective of non-escalation training is preventing officer-induced escalation during police citizen contacts because this is what's causing the majority of the problems with officers in this profession, in this nation. The majority of the issues, we're the ones escalating. Why? Because officers across the country as a whole don't know for sure what their lawful authority is. Folks, Terry v. Ohio has entered its 52nd year in the United States. It's been in place that long. But yet it's the number one category of screw up that leads to the, the majority of the problems in our profession, the lawsuits, the lost careers, and the community distrust. Now, I asked a question on those videos from previous. What did they all have in common? What did they all start with? Right? And all of them started with an unlawful stop and detention. 
So what non-escalation training does is furthers the cause of procedural justice. And I want you to take I want to take you back to this one, the uh, unlawful stop arrest and use of force in under 40 seconds. I'm going to put these shapes up here. And here's what here's what I found from my research. It's called the domino effect. The domino effect. How do you get the third domino not to fall? You keep the second domino from falling. And how do you keep the second domino from falling? Listen carefully. You prevent the first domino from falling. Okay? The next slide demonstrates the power of non escalation training in preventing unlawful stops, unlawful arrests, and unreasonable applications of force because that's exactly where it focuses. It focuses on preventing those three things. So watch the power that the next slide demonstrates in, in what non-escalation training can do to help us overcome these problems that we're seeing on a recurring basis with our profession across the country. Now the goal we want to reduce the incidence of lawsuits, lost careers, and eroding community trust by reducing officer-induced escalation. Here it is. Ladies and gentlemen, when we provide training that prevents that from happening in the first place, that unlawful stop and detention, by default, how many unlawful arrests do you think we can then prevent? And the number is significant. And if the stop doesn't start illegal, and the chances then of unlawful uh, arrest go way down, guess what else by default goes way down? Look at that. Now, I don't know about you, but so far, this is the most beautiful slide in my presentation. It really is. Now, why do you say that, Don? Well, it's not just because of the pretty colors. Here's why this is so beautiful. Isn't this result what we've been seeking? The best way for an officer to de-escalate a situation is to not be the cause of the escalation in the first place. Now, who said that? I did. On October 28, 2019, President Trump signed another executive order. And what did that do? Well, it authorized and designated the Attorney General to create a commission that would explore modern issues affecting law enforcement that most impact the ability of American policing. Will President Trump's law enforcement commission include non-escalation training in their list of recommendations? What do you think? What do you think? If you're a betting person, what would you wager? In fact, I have another question. Or will this yet another commission on law enforcement continue to look at de-escalation training as the answer? Food for thought. Chapter 7, A Better Solution. Our objective through training should be to train officers in non-escalation skills to minimize officer-induced escalation. And it all starts with the Constitution and getting those every officer in this country to understand what that, what that Constitution really means and what their role really is as a freedom fighter, not a citizen fighter. Everybody, everybody that an officer approaches Need, that officer needs to view that human being as though they are wrapped in the Constitution. And the only way you get to that citizen is to lawfully unwrap it. Lawfully do it. So here they are. Unlawful stops and detentions. The number one creator of lawsuits, lost careers, and community distrust. Followed closely by unlawful arrests. And then followed by unreasonable force. And I'm going to reiterate this. The goal of non-escalation training is this. Eliminate this, which will then eliminate this, which then will 
eliminate that in great numbers. Now, do you think that might be helpful? Imagine the positive impact these training models based on building non-escalation skills can have if they're adopted at your academy, they're adopted in your classroom, they're adopted in your field training or police training program, or they're adopted in your ongoing agency training. Wow. We, ladies and gentlemen, can do this. We don't have a choice anymore. It's imperative. If we don't start developing training models that are based on developing non-escalation skills, we're going to continue to fail officers and communities alike. And my research is absolutely clear on that fact. Non-escalation training. Now, you want to look at a model? You want to look at a model that won't fail officers or communities alike? Look at this one. You take one huge part non-escalation training, which provides officers with strategies to prevent officer-induced escalation. You then combine that with de-escalation training which provides officers with strategies to diffuse highly charged situations. What you're going to have is a training model for achieving true procedural justice. And it is a model that will not fail officers or communities alike. So join me in shouting this from the mountaintops. I'd like you to check out what Premier Police Training does offer. We have a confident non-escalation course. It's a three-day course, 24 hours in length, and we absolutely go after officer-induced escalation, not just as a way to prevent it, but to defeat the practice. I also want you to know that if you're a law enforcement officer, I have something for you. It's a document I put together, Basics of Force and 25 Notable Use of Force Case Laws. It's yours. All you have to do is just go to the link that's shown and sign up for it. And we'll get it to you for free. Now, Chief, Sheriff, if you have any kind of input, role to play in selecting law enforcement training, I'm just telling you, don't miss the mark. But we do have something for you as well. So if you head an agency, we have an agency use of force training program assessment. So how good do you think your agency use of force training program is? Well, sign up, go to that link, sign up for free, and we'll deliver that absolutely for nothing to your email inbox. Take it. See how you do. This is the same assessment that I use when I uh, get hired by agencies to come in and put on use of force or search and seizure training. Okay, so please, officers, download that free gift and agency heads, download that assessment, take that assessment, and let's face facts, ladies and gentlemen. There is a problem. But where there's a problem, there's always a solution. And right now the solution is in non-escalation training. Because if we continue to pump out officers who and put officers on the street and the highways and in the fields who don't know their lawful authority through every step of a police citizen contact, we're just going to have another continue. It's just, just hit the repeat button. All right. So I hope that you uh, got something out of this presentation. I do want to thank you for joining me. I'm Dom McCray with Premier Police Training. You can go to our website, premierpolicetraining.com, and look at what we do have to offer. And I am going to say to my brothers and sisters in law enforcement, uh, be safe and do it right and train. Thank you.